turn in your Bibles tonight to Psalm 12. Psalm 12 and verse 1. Psalm 12, verse 1. Here David writes as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. He says, O Lord, excuse me, save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Every and others lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that we have uh, these psalms that we can look back to, not only simply as a historical event, but as seeing how godly men, men led by your Holy Spirit, responded in prayer to you as they faced very trying circumstances. We'd ask, Father, that you'd help us to have the same attitude of clinging to you, dependence on you, uh, when we see tough things happening, maybe things said about us that are very difficult, help us to turn to you and trust in you. We thank you for your promise that we see here in, in this portion of your word. We thank you for David's uh, reflection on your promise and this prayer in light of the promise. We'd ask that you'd take these words and use it in our lives tonight to help us as we live in this sin-stained world. Also, Father, as we look to uh, what your word is, that your word is true and pure, that you would help and encourage us as we reflect on that with the many attacks that come upon your word in our day and age. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we reread through this psalm this evening, we see several good examples here, maybe we'd say bad examples, of what Paul forbids in Ephesians 4 verse 29 that we looked at this morning. In the first half of Ephesians 4 29, Paul writes, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Well, in this psalm, we see a lot of that uh, corrupting talk rotten, worthless, unprofitable, just the speech that we're told not to use. Lies, flattering lips, tongues that make great boasts, all, all that uh, bad news, all that corrupting talk, all that, of course, we as believers are to put off that kind of talk, to not have that coming out of our mouths. We looked at that again this morning. But, of course, in this psalm, that's not the point of this psalm, really. This isn't so much about what we say. But that's what's being said about David to take him down as he is writing this psalm. We noted this a couple weeks ago when we were last in this psalm. Most likely, I don't even know if I want to say most likely. I would just put it this way. I take it that uh, the context, the circumstances that David writes this psalm is when he was being pursued by King Saul and he's hiding out and the Ziphites, those Ziphites, they told King Saul this, for the second time where David was hiding so that Saul could come and get him. He's trying to kill him. So, I mean, they're, they're putting his life on the line. 1 Samuel 26, verse 1. You don't need to turn there, but this is one of those times that the Ziphites did this. It says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hekelah, which is on the east of Jeshimon? I think maybe with the strong language here, 
that this psalm, Psalm 12, was written after the second time they did this to David. But as we noted, the psalm doesn't say this. This is conjecture. We don't know this for sure. Uh, a couple weeks ago when we were last in the psalm, uh, I noted the outline by Willem van Gimmeren is a good outline for this psalm. I'm using that, uh, which is just this four-point outline. First, in verses 1 through 4, prayer for deliverance. Verse 5, promise of the Lord. That's what we looked at, just those five verses last time we were together. But then next, the third part of the outline is reflection on God's promise. That's going to be very significant. We're going to spend some time looking at uh, implications of what David is reflecting about uh, God's word here. That's in verse 6. And then at the end of the psalm again, a prayer for deliverance in verses 7 and 8. I love this psalm. I, I think I probably can say it about whatever I'm preaching and teaching. Uh, <laughs> but I, I really love this psalm and many like this because it reminds us of the reality of living in a sin, sin-stained world. It reminds us that even when there's times when we are doing exactly what God wants us to do, and to this point in David's life, if you read through 1 Samuel, he's never done anything wrong. He's only trusted in the Lord, and God has said how he's blessed him, and God has anointed him as king. He hasn't been installed as king yet. But at this point in his life, we know we've seen zero bad stuff that David has done. And yet, here is King Saul chasing around Israel, trying to kill him. Sometimes I think we have the sense that if we're doing everything right, and if we're just living great for the Lord, nothing bad will ever happen to us. This psalm and many like this, it's a reminder that no, you can be just straight as an arrow, uh, living for the Lord and having great faith in him, and still you, you, will, you can be going through great trials where your life is literally on the line. Uh, as this psalm was being written, Saul was trying to kill David. If this is during the time of the Ziphites, even if not, it probably is still in that time frame. It was David and his 400 men against Saul and his 3,000 men. So if, if ever a matchup came, it would be very bad. So let's just review for a moment what we've already seen. Last time we were together, we saw the prayer for deliverance. Look down to verse 1. Save, O Lord. That's the heart of the prayer. Just God, act and move and save here. I need you. Please help me. Then the reason, it's stated with a little hyperbole, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. So this is the need. A little more specifically with uh, a prayer, here's what David was asking. Again, we looked at this two weeks ago. Verse 3, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts, those who say, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? So he's being more specific with his prayers what he's asking God to do here. So that's the prayer for deliverance. And then second, we saw last time we were together, the promise of the Lord, verse 5. Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. It's a great promise. God's concern for the poor and the needy and the people in a desperate situation. Again, sometimes you think, well, if I'm just living right now, that stuff would happen. I wouldn't be poor or needy or desperate. No, God says, uh, well, first of all, David's in it. But secondly, God's promise is, because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, they're, they're in that tough situation, they're facing these things, I will now arise. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. It's a great promise and a great verse to memorize in the difficulties of our lives when we're desperate and needy and uh, God promises I will now arise 
God answered this promise. God provided David with safety. We saw that last time we were together. He did what he promised. And that's where we ended the last time we were together. But next in our outline is this, verse 6. Reflection on God's promise. Verse 6, Psalm 12, verse 6. The, war, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. So God makes this promise in verse 5. And now in the midst of the psalm, David is reflecting on that promise. He's contemplating what this means for his situation. And what he comes up with as the Holy Spirit is leading him in his thinking and all this. And he writes what God wants him to write. But verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. Many of us have rings on here tonight. And I don't think probably anyone who has a ring on here tonight would say that your, your ring is pure gold. I don't, maybe someone has a pure gold ring tonight. But most of our, our rings are a mix of gold or silver or whatever. And an alloy, it has something else with it. What the psalmist is saying here as he reflects on God's promise is... Uh, there's no alloy in God's words. There's no alloy of undependability. There's no mixture of uh, good and bad. It's all pure. It's all good. It's, it's all something, if God said this, I can count on it. Like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. So God's word, like silver, it's already a valuable uh, quantity. But what this illustration is getting at is that you can melt down silver and melt down silver and melt down silver. Just get any impurity out of it, every possible alloy out of that silver. Uh, they're all gone. That's what God's word is like, pure. There's no alloy. There, there's nothing else mixed with it. It's just entirely good and true and perfect. God's word has no impurities. In this context, I think uh, Bible scholar Craigie uh, has a, a good statement. He says, by implication, the speech of wicked persons is all dross, devoid of any silver or gold. That of God is pure silver, pure gold, it's devoid of the dross of flattery, vanity, and lies, and therefore can be relied upon absolutely. That's what David is getting at with this promise of God. You can rely on it absolutely. There's nothing false, nothing bad, nothing wrong, nothing mixed with it. It's God's word. But now look to verse 7 in the last portion of our outline. Prayer for deliverance. That's how it starts. That's how it ends. Verses 7 and 8. You, O Lord, will keep them. These words, these promises. You will guard us from this generation forever. Remember, that's what his promise was. So, all the poor, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to guard them. You will guard us from this generation forever. Verse 8. On every side the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. There's a great positive here, something very encouraging as you look at verses 7 and 8 together. When you look at these two verses together, you realize as David is writing what he writes here, nothing has changed yet in his circumstances. And he's starting off, there's all these wicked people and they're saying all these wicked things and they're betraying me if this is the context if this is the background they're betraying me to king saul my life is on the line uh well the wicked are still out there in verse eight they, they haven't disappeared yet but as david reflects upon the promise of god in verse five and brings out that god's words are pure there's nothing mixed about them. I can count on them. 
even though his circumstances have not changed at all yet, he still concludes in verse 7, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. You will do this because this is who you are. This is what your word is like. This is what you promised. I trust you no matter the circumstances. So what I want you to note here is, again, the circumstances haven't changed yet. They will. God will fulfill this promise. But as David is writing this psalm, nothing has, has changed yet. But he's very confident as he reflects upon God and God's words and that God will keep his promises and his words are pure. So even though circumstances have not yet changed, he makes this very confident statement in verse 7, prayer. You, O Lord, will keep them. I know this is true. You will guard us. You will save us from this generation forever. Now, in David's day, we see in verse 8, a general truth given. I'm sad to say it seems like we see this in our day as well. Uh, verse 8, we just read that. Read it again. Verse 8. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of men, of man. Kirkpatrick uh, brings out the idea, he, he writes this, when worthless, so the term vile, that uh, the Hebrew word behind it is somewhat rare, for a Hebrew word is very rare, but it has two possible ideas, they both kind of fit together. Worthless, that, that might be kind of the idea, of the vile or profligate, uh, just, uh, what would you say, someone given to reckless wastefulness, uh, someone who's wildly extravagant. Okay, could, it's, it's kind of both those ideas, that's what vileness is. So Kirkpatrick uses that terminology describing uh, verse 8. When worthless or profligate people, men, are raised to positions of authority. That's the idea when it says, as vileness is exalted among the children of men. So these kind of people, they're the worthless, they're profligate, and they're raised up. They're exalted to positions of authority. When that happens, so I'm mixing what he's saying with what I'm saying. Sorry about that. I'll go back to what he's saying. Uh, when worthless or profligate men are raised to positions of authority, the wicked stalk insolently everywhere, unabashed and unrestrained. That's the start of the verse. On every side, the wicked prowl. The one thing leads to another. As vileness is exalted among the children of man, then the wicked prowl openly on every side. Uh, I hate to say it, but I think this is what we see kind of playing out more and more in our society, more and more in the world. Uh, vileness, wickedness, just profligacy, <laughs> using that kind of old word. That's what we see being elevated, raised to positions of influence and leadership. And when that happens, as that happens, well, then on every side, the wicked are prowling. They're just out and about, and it doesn't matter uh, if people... What they think or not, they're, they're out and about and they're doing their wickedness and it doesn't seem like there's much for consequences. That's what's good about this psalm, though. David did see this in his day. It's not just 21st century America. He's writing about things that happened in his day. And this whole psalm is about living in that situation. He prayed, save, O Lord, do something. He heard and meditated on God's promise and they confidently lived in light of it and prayed again in light of it in verse 7. Even when the circumstances had not yet changed, God is more powerful than any of the wicked or the vile that are out there. So again, a psalm like this is great just to be praying on your own in our circumstances right now. Now, in the remainder of our time tonight, I want to focus a little more on verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. This is a good verse that uh, is, I guess we could call it a proof text 
for what we believe about the Bible as a whole. Sometimes you hear proof texting, and that has a negative connotation, but I just mean it to use. This is, this is a verse that we go to when we're talking about the doctrine of inerrancy. I think, are all of you familiar with inerrancy? Have you ever heard that word before tonight? I think most of you have heard that. Verse 6 again. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. This verse would bring out that God's word is inerrant. Uh, here's a good definition of inerrancy given by Paul Feinberg. This is what this means when we, we talk about the word of God being inerrant. When all the facts are known, the scriptures, in their original autographs, you know, so how it was originally written, not necessarily a copy where maybe an error was made in some copy somewhere down the line. When all the facts are known, the scripture in their original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be wholly true in everything they affirm, whether it has to do with doctrine or morality or with the social, physical, or life sciences what the scriptures affirm it's all true it's all reliable it's all genuine there used to be arguments i'm well to this day i'm sure there is in broadly evangelical circles asking the question is the bible inerrant and the answer from a verse like this yes it is inerrant uh it, it's Holy true, it's pure words and everything that it affirms. So uh, if it's talking about creation, we can trust the Bible about creation. If it's talking about uh, a historical matter like Exodus, the Exodus of uh, Israel out of Egypt, okay, that, that's true, that's true, we believe that. If it's talking about uh, Things today which are controversial, uh, sexual relations, sexual immorality, homosexuality, uh, transgenderism, wherever it speaks in regards to any of those things, it's true. No matter what the attacks might be against it, when we say the Bible is inerrant, we say this is true. Whatever it says about whatever subject it says, I guess we put a little caveat with that, if you're interpreting it rightly, sometimes over the years, some people have come up with some strange twists on what they say it means. But yeah, if you're saying what it really says, it's true. It's true. You can rely on that and count on that. Um, why do we believe this, that the scriptures are inherent, inerrant? First, because it makes those claims of itself, like right here. And we see these kinds of claims that the Bible makes about itself confirmed in reality. We see prophecies fulfilled. We see miracles such as the resurrection make historical sense. We see the stories of the Bible backed up with archaeological discoveries that for a while people are like, oh, we don't know if we can believe this story because there's nothing archaeologically proving it. And then 100 years later, oh, here it is. Yeah, okay, well, we should trust the Bible to start with. Uh, we see its power through history in changing lives and even civilizations. So we presuppose the Bible is wholly true in everything it affirms because that's what it says. And we see that this is a reasonable belief to take based on what it says because we see that's borne out in reality in all these different areas. Uh, I don't know. I think we'll be able to develop this a little bit. But here's a basic three-point uh, syllogism. I'm probably not quite saying that right. On how we develop the doctrine of inerrancy. First... All the words of Scripture are God's words. In other words, what we see in the Bible, God is saying. 
That's number one. We, we see that. Second, we see that God cannot lie. So first we establish it's all God's word. Second, we say, well, God cannot lie. Okay. And third, therefore, all the words of Scripture, because it's all God's words, are completely true and without error. I'll just try to briefly go through this here. Uh, first, and, and most important in this chain of logical uh, truths, all the words of Scripture are God's words. In other words, what the Scripture says, God says. Where do we get that from? It's evidenced by four things. First, the repeated phrase throughout the Bible, thus says the Lord. Uh, I did a computer search on this phrase in the English Standard Version. That occurs, just guess how many times of that phrase, and that probably is stated kind of differently, but that specific phrase, what would you guess? How often is that phrase used? Thus says the Lord. You could throw out any number. I'm not going to make fun of you. Thousand? Okay, that's good. 6,000. Wow, that's really up there. Okay. Well, now I feel bad of what I'm going to say. 417 times in the Old Testament. 417 times from Exodus to Malachi. The first recorded example is in Exodus. Exodus chapter 4, verse 20. Why don't you turn quickly back there in your Bibles. Exodus 4, verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Thus says the Lord. 417 times we see that in the Old Testament. So it just says this of itself. God is talking. God is speaking. God is saying. Second, there's the standard of prophecy that is given in the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 13, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm not going to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read those uh, right now, but uh, the standard of prophecy wasn't, if a prophet says something, usually it should come true. The standard of prophecy given in Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. So prophecy is 100%. That's the standard of prophecy. It's not pretty good. It's not, oh, good guess there. It's, no, if God says it, it, it 100%, it will come true. Third, the New Testament indicates that all the Old Testament writings are regarded as God's word. Why don't you turn over to 2 Timothy 3.16. Many of you here tonight probably have this memorized. It's a great one to have memorized. It's all great to have memorized. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is breathed out by God. I like that ESV translation. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Very clearly it says all scripture, not parts of it, not just the New Testament or uh, everything but Genesis 1 through 11. All scripture is breathed out by God. Maybe you think, well, there's the time when Jonah was in the belly of the whale. I'm not so sure about that. No, that was breathed out by God. All of it. And note, sometimes we, you'll catch me saying this occasionally, but technically it's not 
the best to put it this way, the writings, the scripture is breathed out by God. So what we have here, all scripture is inspired or breathed out by God. Uh, the, the focus is on the, the scripture, not so much the author in that statement. The writings, the scripture, that's what's breathed out by God. One scholar notes, uh, Wayne Grudem, he says, since it is writings that are said to be breathed out, this breathing must be understood as a metaphor for speaking the words of Scripture. This verse thus states in brief form what was evident in many passages in the Old Testament. The Old Testament writings are regarded as God's word in written form. For every word of the Old Testament, God is the one who spoke it. Uh, we see this when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes when you look, if you just look in the New Testament, when, when it says something like God says, it's quoting a Old Testament scripture that God isn't necessarily even speaking. It's literally not God talking there. But since all the Old Testament, since all the scripture is God's word, it can say God says X, even if it's not literally like in Psalm uh, 12, verse 5, where God says, I promise this. Uh, you could look at the whole Psalm 12 and say, God says whatever in the whole Psalm. What about the New Testament? Writings in the New Testament are also referred to as Scripture. There are times, this, this is a little trickier, so maybe write these verses down. There are times when the New Testament itself is referred to in this way as Scripture. 1 Timothy 5.18 says this, For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Now, the first part of that, that's found in the Old Testament. Where's that second phrase found when it says, and the scripture says this, 1 Timothy 5.18, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Where in the Old Testament is it says, the laborer deserves his wages? It doesn't say that in the Old Testament. Well, what's he quoting here? What's he calling scripture? Where is it found? It's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, which says, Jesus is talking and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. So Luke is being called scripture. Uh, Turn over to 2 Peter 3.15. We're about done here this evening. But also, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, also is equating Paul's words. What, I, what I'm trying to bring out is, if you're just thinking Old Testament scripture, but New Testament isn't, you probably would never think such things. But there are some uh, liberal people out there who would say such things. If, if you're ever thinking that, we, we, we see how this is not the case. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Here Peter is writing. And he says, Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. I always uh, get a kick out of that, that Peter says that about Paul's writings. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Peter here equates distorting Paul's words with distorting scriptures. In other words, the, the equivalence is there, the implication is there. Oh, Paul's words are scripture. So the New Testament writings are scripture also. Bottom line, the New Testament writers were 
also conveying God's word, scripture. What they wrote was God's word. What they wrote was scripture also. So biggest part of the whole thing when we're talking about inerrancy is the fact that all the scripture is God's word. That, that has to be established. And, and that's what scripture says about itself. Old Testament, New Testament, everything. Second, God cannot lie. That's just one verse. We, we could go to more than that, I'm sure. But uh, the NAS translates Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. It's God's very character. He cannot lie. If all this is God's word, and if God cannot lie, then what? Third, therefore all the words of Scripture are without error and true. God cannot lie. That's inerrancy. That's Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. That's Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's Psalm 119, verse 51. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. It's all true. It's all without error. It's all good. And then, of course, Jesus' words in John 17. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. What? Your word, thy word, is truth without error. This is what we have before us. That's why we study it Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and on our own probably daily and in Bible studies and listening to the radio and whatever all crazy things the world is saying that dispute this, we say, thy word is truth and I can rely on your word. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that your words are pure. We thank you that Jesus said your word is truth. It's just the definition of what truth is. As your people, we thank you that we have that light in increasingly dark times. We ask that you would help us to uh, consistently to rely on your word as truth, as David did. As we see in this psalm tonight, Psalm 12, after David reflects on your word and says, your words are pure, he immediately moves on from that to say, this will happen. You will guard me. You will guard the poor. You will keep me because that's what you promised and your words are true. Help us to have that same uh, attitude of reliance and confidence in all your word in whatever it says about any subject, and act accordingly. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.